Hello, I'm Marlene Harris Taylor, managing producer of health at IdeaStream Public Media. And welcome to an interactive virtual town hall that we're calling Fighting Poverty in the Pandemic. You've probably heard this fact. Cleveland is the poorest large city in the country, according to 2019 data from the US Census Bureau. That means there are more than 114,000 people living in poverty in our region with persistent child poverty and with poverty among seniors on the rise. The pandemic has made it harder for our city's most vulnerable residents to get access to the resources they need as widespread unemployment amplified the demand for food and childcare assistance, job training, housing, and other basic needs. The last year has also seen constant changes in aid by local, state, and federal governments that can be hard for people to navigate. For instance, Ohio opted to end the extra federal unemployment insurance. It gave those looking for work an extra $300 a week. Now that ran out the last weekend of June, but in just a few weeks, millions of families will start to see monthly payments from the federal government in the form of new expanded tax credits, which experts suggest could help lift many families out of poverty. Now this hour, we're going to talk about how the pandemic impacted the landscape for those living in poverty and how community partners stepped in to help meet that demand. We'll discuss the outstanding gaps in the system that need to be addressed, such as the so-called benefits, benefits cliff and what the pandemic revealed about how close so many of us are to being unable to, meet, to make ends meet. But this conversation is not complete without you, the listener. We want you to share your questions or comments on poverty in our community in the Facebook Live chat and include them throughout the show. In fact, if you're on Facebook Live right now, start by sharing your name and where you're listening from so that we can get this conversation rolling. We'll hear two different panels during the next hour. First, we'll focus more on how basic needs like food, and healthcare access were impacted during the pandemic. And then the second part of the town hall will focus more on unemployment and education. Okay, let's introduce our first guest, including Kristen Wazoka, from the, the president and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Thanks so much for being here, Kristen. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Kristen, I don't know why I'm having trouble with your name today. Kristen Wazoka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, even, I even practiced and I still didn't get it right, but welcome. <laughs> Susan Fuhrer is also joining us. She's the president of the Institute for Hope with the Metro Health System. Thanks for joining us, Susan. John Corlett is also here. John is the president and the executive director of the Center for Community Solutions. John, thanks for sharing your expertise as well. And Dale Anglin is the vice president for programs with the Cleveland Foundation. Dale, thanks for being a part of this. So John, let's start with you. We don't have all the data yet on how the pandemic impacted the poverty landscape, but I think it's safe to assume that, you know, it hasn't improved the situation much. Now in September, 2020, a report for your organization said, today there are more than twice as many unemployed people in Cuyahoga County than there were in September of 2019. So John, uh, that must have created a lot more need in our community. Oh, Marlene, I think you're right. Uh, you know, this has been you know, a really interesting um, experience and it's unlike any other sort of downturn that we've experienced before because you know, one of the points I often make is that this was a downturn or is a downturn that affected in some ways women more than men because women tended to be employed in occupations that were affected by the shutdown, restaurants, hotels, uh, entertainment. Um, and, and, and also then they were also affected because schools and daycare were not available. Mm -hmm. so particularly when school was remote again this last fall, a lot of women, particularly women with children left the workforce and in many instances still have not come back. Uh, so I think that's what was different, I think, about this uh, recession. Because mm -hmm, uh, past recessions often impacted men more. 
absolutely it was more focused in manufacturing and places like that where we didn't see the number of uh, unemployment claims as we saw in some of those industries most where jobs are most held by women mm -hmm. and Kristen one way that you can measure the impact of the last year was how busy that you guys were at the Cleveland Food Bank uh, can you talk about you know that increase in need you saw because I mean we all saw those lines Kristen yeah absolutely you know um the minute the pandemic hit and the governor issued his shutdown or a stay at home order, we began to see an increase in demand um, all, immediately. And uh, we quickly turned to doing drive through distributions um, to try to meet the increased need as well as provide box food to many of our partner agencies so they could do the same. Um, and ultimately uh, in the 12 month period between last March and this March, we served more than 400,000 people that is one in four people in our six county service area. Um, wow. And it's 100,000 more people than the previous year who turned to us for help. That is amazing. And who could forget those images of those long lines, you know, on uh, the visuals online and on the news. It was just, it was just so heartbreaking. Yeah, Kristen, and unfortunately it continues. We're still seeing long lines in the media. Still seeing long lines, they haven't diminished at all. Uh, last Thursday, um, we served about 1,900 families. That's more than 5,000 people. Wow. I thought maybe it had eased up a little bit. Getting a little better, but. <sighs> so Kristen, I know you probably heard stories from people um, who, would come, came, who came through the line who said, I've never needed this before. This is my first time doing this. Can you talk about that a little bit? All the time. All the time. We served 170,000 new people last year. Um, very early in the pandemic, I met um, a mom with three kids who turned to us for assistance. Um, she was very proud that she had never before needed any sort of assistance. She'd always been able to make it on her own and care for kids um, without help from anybody, she told me. Uh, but she'd been working at a downtown hotel. Um, and she also had a kind of a side gig. Uh, I believe it was driving for Uber. And so when the pandemic hit and the hotel business dried up, she was immediately laid off. And even that side job, um, there was less, uh, less work for her. And so, and all three of her kids were suddenly learning from home. Wow. So, you know, she was, you know, she was embarrassed to need help. You know, and I said to her, this is what we're here for. And you shouldn't be embarrassed. And, uh, you know, people hit hard times and this is a hard time. Um, and, you know, thankfully, thanks to a generous community, we were able to provide that additional support. Wow, that's tough. It hit both of her jobs. And I, I understand that embarrassment that people feel who, who've been able to take care of themselves. So Susan, we actually spoke to a gentleman named Charles Taylor ahead of the show that you recommended that we speak to who uses the food as medicine clinic at Metro Health. I've been to that clinic. It's, it's a really nice clinic. And it's regularly stocked by the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And we wanted to talk to someone who uses the services that we're talking about here today. And he told us he's 63 years old. He's had health issues, including diabetes, and he has trouble walking. And now here's what he had to say about why this clinic is so important to him. I can't stand very long on my knees anyway, and it's hard for me to get from point A to B to C, quite limited, because I have to walk to the bus. I'm catch I'm on the bus and I lost my last vehicle, so I have to catch the bus. And then for some places, that's quite difficult because if I'm going to get some food or something, I can't carry the food very well in myself sometimes. I understand that you use sometimes the, the pantry at Metro Health, the food pantry. Yes, yes. How did you get, how did you learn about that? How did you get introduced to it? Dr. Margolius, he referred me to them, to the nutritionist. Then they asked me if I would be interested in picking up some food at the hospital, and it helps me out financially, and it helps me out physically. Yeah. Oh, how does it help you out financially? Because we don't have to worry about trying to sacrifice a couple dollars to buy some more food. You said it also helped you out physically? Yes, yeah, physically, because I eat better. <laughs> I eat a little smarter. I try to follow the suggestions, you know. 
you know, Charles, he, when he shared that story with uh, myself and Rachel Rude, the producer of this program, he, he was so real, you know, and it was just so generous of him to share his story with us. So John, um, who has been impacted the most by the economic turmoil over the last year? You know, you talked about how women were impacted with this, by this, you know, and they left the workforce in droves, right? And that was uh, primarily driven by the child care capacity issue, right? Right, right. When, you know, as I said earlier, is when schools closed and child care centers closed, you know, they found themselves with no place uh, where their kids would normally be. And so, you know, they were sort of faced with the situation of either having to give up their job so that they could be there to support their kids through their education, which I think was challenging. You know, I, I knew families, you know, where three kids to be on three iPads at different times, different things, and not all these families had the broadband access that they needed. I know there was a community effort to try and sort of uh, alleviate that problem, but I think that was the big issue too. I think the other group, and I, you know, Charles is a good example of it. I think older adults, you know, really too bore a, a significant brunt to this epidemic, you know, particularly around isolation. Um, you know, they say that isolation, you know, is as detrimental to your health sometimes as a pack of cigarettes because mm -hmm. it, it really takes a lot out of you. And so I think older adults, you know, particularly those who might've been in assisted living facilities, whether they were locked down, couldn't leave their rooms, you know, their meals were delivered to them. I think a lot of people, it's going to take us a while to sort of process all this and understand all this. I think you're right about that. And Susan, I want to come back to you and talk about, you know, Charles talked about that, you know, the food is medicine clinic and how important it is to him. And can you talk about, you know, what that, what clinics like that, what your clinic means to the community? Metro Health, we see the effects of people that are trying to, to lift themselves out of difficult times every single day. And Mr. Taylor is just one of those examples. And what we see are the results of not having access to healthy food and things like that, resulting in chronic disease. And that's what you know, Mr. Taylor fell apart, you know, fell upon. So the Food as Medicine Clinic is really important. And during the pandemic, it was particularly important. So a shout out to Kristen and everybody at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank because they helped us, you know, when people called our COVID hotline, we not only screened them for their clinical needs, but we screened them for their social needs. And much like John said, social isolation was the number one illness, one of the number one issues for um, psychosocial issues. And so we created a Calls for Hope um, line where we actually called and did social calls. Uh, Bishop Minor did faith-based calls um, to people and they actually were calling him saying, Bishop Minor, you haven't called me this week, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> and food was important too. You know, if you were asked to be quarantined, you couldn't go out to get food. And so Kirsten and her team stepped in and we actually had food in our trunks. And when someone would call the COVID hotline and they were told to quarantine by a clinician, we would take food to them and their families as well as diapers and kinds of supplies that they needed to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. so I think, uh, you know, John was right about this isolation thing and we don't know when, we, and we won't know for a while what it did to, to all of us, right? I wanna to go to Dale. Dale, you know, while all this on the ground effort was going on, the Cleveland Foundation and other organizations in the region were working together to support these efforts. And they had to do it really quickly, you know, hence that COVID-19 rapid response fund. Now, can, you, can you tell us about that, Dale? Sure, thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, we worked with literally over 40 foundations, in the end over 2,500 individuals. And in about four days, we raised $4 million. Once they closed the schools, we realized how important this was gonna be and how impactful this was gonna be. And frankly, no one foundation was gonna be able to address the needs alone. So over time now, fast forward over 15 months later, we've raised over $20 million. Um, and given almost all of that out, but now not just in rapid response fund, we're now working in vaccine access. We've been working in PPE. In fact, our partner, Neighborhood Connections, who we funded to get PPE out to neighbors, because what people don't remember is not everybody had dollars to keep replenishing their masks. Some oh, yeah. of the people did, but not everybody did. And, and the government who we thought, frankly, was going to provide that to everybody couldn't do that. They were doing that for EMTs and fire and nursing homes. So we actually created with Neighborhood Connections a distribution point where they could deliver masks and other supplies to East and West Side 
and they gave us a stat recently, they gave out 2.5 million case uh, things of PPE. 2.5 million. Ones or cases? Uh, individual masks. Okay. Individual wow. masks. Plus they gave out like toiletries and all sorts of things that were basic needs that people needed. Because, you know, even though the food bank was doing great work, we had a lot of people who couldn't get to the food bank. So I would say you have to add on to the numbers that the food bank fed of the mm -hmm. people who needed food because they were people, there were neighborhood organizations in every neighborhood who pivoted to food. So add on to what the Christ, what um, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, which is an incredible partner, add on the numbers of people who were using those things. So we were so proud, frankly, to work with so many organizations and foundations, corporate, private, other community foundations, and we're staying together and we're co continuing to do some more work so that we can support the community coming out of this COVID fund. Yeah, you're right. How quickly we forget, right? Remember when that PPE was like the thing that everybody needed. I didn't even know what PPE was March of 2020. <laughs> And now that's kind of calmed down. So we've almost forgotten about it, but that was so huge just yes. a year ago. So yes. Dale, the partnership between the foundations and donors has been so successful that you guys are going to keep working together to tackle this issue. Yeah, yeah. We, we're technically Other in phase issues, Yeah. Yeah, we're technically in phase two. And in the fall, we'll launch a phase three. And phase frankly, three. What, we, what we learned is we do, we, of course, we do well in the community with the dollars that we have, but we can do even more together. So we're working together on vaccine access. We have a whole task force actually of non-funders who are helping us think through how do we get more people up to date on the vaccine. You're gonna start seeing actually this week, billboards and flyers and, and on things on buses with neighborhood people who you all know um, talking about, please get the vaccine. It helps you, it helps everybody else. Those are dollars that we helped pay local people to help figure out how to what would be the messages that would work better, you know, with our neighbors? And literally it's targeted neighborhood by neighborhood. So someone in Kinsman only wants to hear from someone in Kinsman. Someone on in you know, old Brooklyn. We did it neighborhood by neighborhood. That's give me an example of somebody from the neighborhood that people will know. So um actually Kim Foreman is one you'll see. She's one of our wonderful spokeswomen. We've got elders often in the community, um, our, our abuelas and our grandmas who are the ones who, you know, are always telling us, please do the right thing. And getting the vaccine is the right thing. Okay. But we had to do it in Spanish. We're doing it in multiple languages. You're oh, going to see great. a lot of it over the next few weeks. Um, okay. But I will just say so grateful to the corporations and the foundations who have come together. We will continue to work on policy together. We're talking, we're talking with the state and the, and the feds actually, and others around how can we implement policies or change policies that will help so many of our families like childcare, like our moms who have been hit so hard by this. We're working on data collection. We want to collect different data. So okay. frankly, we know in philanthropy, who are we helping? We don't actually always know that. We want to make sure we support our black and brown led groups more because they were hit so hard by this incredible pandemic. Now, Dale, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, systemic racism is a topic that's close to my heart and our health team at Idea Stream. And I know that that's something that this group that's come together is going to continue to work on. Can you talk about systemic racism? You know, because that's a part of this discussion of persistent yeah, you know, Absolutely. So when you talk about COVID, it's, it's, it's so linked to systemic racism. It's so linked to economic hardship for so many types of people. But let's be clear, it was very clear who was linked to the most. Um, black and brown, low income, rural, those people were hit the hardest, period. There's, there's so much data to support that. So the question is, how do, frankly, in, at least in philanthropy, I, I'll just talk about the area that I, that I work in. How do we think through how we support organizations, more black and brown led organizations? Um, how do we help, frankly, all of our institutions just even understand systemic racism? It's not something everybody's used to talking about. Um, you're going to see a, a lot of information coming out in the next few months from a number of foundations working together around how do we keep these conversations going. This isn't a we're done and we're done in one year talking about this. Right. As we call it, it's your racial equity journey. You have a personal <laughs> one. You have a professional one. You have an organizational one. Nothing's wrong with that. We're just relearning our history in the accurate way. And we're trying to figure out how to make sure that we're supporting people in the ways that they should be supported. 
So yeah. frankly, I'm grateful for our, our foundation colleagues all over Northeast Ohio. It's amazing the, 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 the uh, partnerships we've had um, and we're keep, we're, everybody's staying at the table. We're all supporting all of this again in phase three. Um, yeah. We'll be raising money to do that. Okay, well, I, I love that, the journey, right? Because it didn't take us a year to get here and it's not going to take us a year to solve this. And let me just say, let me just reset for the audience in case some folks are just joining us on Facebook. That was Dale Anglin speaking from the Cleveland Foundation. Also joining us is Kristen Rizoka. Rizoka. Kristen, I'm going to get this right before the night is over. Kristen Rizoka from the Cleveland, uh, Greater Cleveland Food Bank. We also have John Corlett from Community Solutions and Susan Fuhrer from Metro Health from the Institute of Hope. And Susan, let's talk a little bit about you know, we people hear this term social determinants of health, right? Can you talk about what that is a little bit? Because it's kind of a fancy term that people in the medical world, they know and I know because I cover health. But what does social determinants of health mean and how does poverty feed into these uh, people, uh, social determinants of health, people having issues with social determinants of health? Thank you, Marlene. So we, we know that, you know, 80% of someone's overall health and well-being is due to factors that happen outside of the hospital or the healthcare setting and genetics. And those 80% of those factors have to do with where people work, live, and play. And people of color, black and brown, live in areas where there's not good air, it's hard to get transportation, it's hard to get to your job, it's hard to get to a grocery store because often there aren't grocery stores. We found during COVID that they don't even have the ability to have access to the internet because internet providers have not gone into these vulnerable neighborhoods. And so these are the social determinants of health. And so at the Institute for Hope, which stands for Health Opportunity Partnership and Empowerment, we are moving upstream beyond the walls of the hospital to address these social needs for not only our patients, but the entire community. Because if we can address these social needs, we are going to see less chronic disease and illness and need for medical care and hospitalization on the back end. So it's population health moving upstream, getting into our neighborhoods, getting into our communities, identifying what the needs of the people are at that moment and getting those needs to them where they are at, not asking them to come to a hospital, not necessarily asking them to go to Unilot to try to get the, car, get the food from their car, but how can we get these resources to people when they need them? Right, so that idea that a lot of your healthcare is outside of the doctor's office in the hospital, and that's really, really important and something we're trying to grapple with in our community. So Susan, in June, the Institute of Health, you partnered with the company Unite Us, yes. which basically helps us better coordinate how a person uses social services and government agencies along yes. with their healthcare. Absolutely. We'll be able to, now we'll be able to use the data from that figure out where the are. gaps are in the system. For people so, you know, some of the things that Dale yeah. was talking about, you know, helping um, foundations and philanthropy understand where do we have needs and gaps, you know, the Unitas, um, which is in Ohio, the United Ohio Network is going to help us do that. This is um, an electronic platform that is basically supported by the healthcare systems and any 501c3 uh, community-based organization can join for free. And what it does is it allows referrals to be made not only amongst the healthcare systems to CBOs, but amongst the CBOs. And I think a great example that we heard just recently was the Seeds of Literacy that teaches people to read. And they, you know, the CEO said, one of our clients came in and said that they didn't have access to food and they didn't have access to transportation. And so they were able to leverage the Unite Ohio Network to reach out to the food bank. The food bank was able to get this person on SNAP responded in the Unite Ohio network. And so when the person came back for their next reading lesson, they could actually follow up and say, oh, we see you got SNAP. And you know they were able to reinforce that. And the CEO said, you know, this is just wonderful for my employees because often they're faced with people that come to read but have other social needs that they don't know how to address. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, you know, one example. And we are so looking forward to having um, everyone in the community join this network so that we have very real-time transparent information about what the needs are. The Cleveland oh. Clinic's going to join next month as is St. Vincent's Charity. 
Okay, thank you for that. So we have a question that came in from Facebook and John, I'm gonna ask you to tackle this one. Uh, Pat said, uh, what a huge issue is the cost of healthcare, especially since Biden hasn't followed through on his promise to lower the age of Medicare access or make it a public option. Um, that, that is a, a big thing that people are still dealing with. We're talking about outside of the hospital, but inside of the hospital and medical care, the cost is still huge, John, that people are tackling, especially people in poverty, right? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, you're right. The cost of health care is, is a real issue, uh, particularly pharmaceuticals. I mean, that's where we've seen just sort of really significant uh, cost increases, particularly over the last few years. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think this underscores the need for policy action, you know, that we, we can't fix this with, I mean, philanthropy is fantastic. It's essential. But you know, we need a systemic solution to some of these issues, you know, because when I think about, you know, we talk about the folks who are impacted, you know, uh, by this pandemic, you know, I think about policy solutions like uh, raising the minimum wage, uh, making it easy, maybe lowering the uh, Medicare age down to 55 from 65. So because that's a population too, that ha will have a harder time bouncing back, because at an older age, it's harder to find employment. If you're unemployed and 55 or 60 years old, you'll have a much more difficult time, you know, finding employment uh, in any job market. But probably yeah, that's what the that's what the Facebook commenter was talking about. Do you think there's any chance that the Biden administration will be able to do that? You know, I think you know there is likely to be more federal action in the months ahead. You know, certainly there's talk about an infrastructure bill. There seems to be some agreement around that. I think the um, the president, President Biden, will also use budget reconciliation again, uh, which allows them to pass a bill with a simple majority vote. And that may be one of the elements that becomes a part of it, because I do think it would be important. It would also be a huge cost saving for states because it would remove those people from their state Medicaid programs and move them into Medicare. So it would be a big boost for Ohio in terms of our economy and what we spend on health care through the Medicaid program. Well, we're just about out of time for this segment, but I want to end by talking about the gaps that still need to be addressed for people who live in poverty. Poverty, I'm sorry. Kristen, I'm going to ask you to take that first. And Sue, I want you to comment on that as well. What are the gaps that still need to be addressed that are out there? You know, we have always known that hunger is a symptom of another issue. If, um, if one of our clients had the dollars they needed, they'd go to the grocery store and they'd buy their own food first. Um, and they often buy as much of their own food as they can afford. And then when the runny, money runs out, they turn to us. And the most frequent drivers of food insecurity are issues associated with employment, housing, and health care. And so, um, you know, as long as our clients are struggling with those three issues, they may always struggle to put food on the table on a consistent basis. And so, you know, that's why we've been leaning into making referrals and working with these other wonderful community partners to try to make sure that those issues are addressed along with their day-to-day um, -day hunger issues. So then ultimately in the long run, um, they can come out um, more self-sufficient and more food secure. Okay, thanks. So Susan, if you could take that same question. Sure, I'll just um, agree with Kristen, you know, uh, employment, housing, and access to quality health care are big issues. As we've been screening um, Metro Health patients for social determinants, we actually went to the COVID clinics and screened while they waited. Um, certainly social isolation is its top and housing is becoming a really big issue. And I think we were really worried about what's gonna happen the next few months um, with housing um, as, as we move forward. So this is something we are working um, really closely with all our community partners on, on how to make sure that people have safe um, housing. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Susan. So that wraps up this first part of our conversation. And I want to thank our first panel, Kristen Rizoka. Did I, I got it right, Kristen. Yay. The president and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, Susan Fuhrer, president of the Institute for Hope with Metro Health. John Corlett, President and Executive Director of the Center for Community Solutions, and Dale Anglin, Vice President for Programs with the Cleveland Foundation. Thanks to all of you for being part of this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And just a reminder to those of you watching us on Facebook, we want to hear from you. So we're coming to you on Facebook Live. And throughout this conversation, we want to hear your questions and comments related to how we can address poverty in our community. Okay, now it's time to invite us our next set of panelists. 
we come into this conversation. And now we're going to focus more on education and employment as it relates to those living in poverty and community partners who are also helping those in need. So joining me for this part of the conversation are Dr. Jacqueline Chisholm, President and CEO of Step Forward, the Anti-Poverty Agency for Cuyahoga County, formerly known as the Council for Economic Opportunities in Greater Cleveland. Welcome, Dr. Chisholm. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Frank Brickner is also joining us. He is the interim CEO at Ohio Means Jobs, Cleveland, Cuyahoga County. Welcome, Mr. Brickner. Thank you, Marlene. Great to be here. And also we have Victor Ruiz, Executive Director of Esperanza, which provides support to Hispanic students and families of Northeast Ohio. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And uh, we also have Natoya Walker Minor, Deputy General Manager of Administration and External Affairs of the Greater Cleveland RTA. Welcome. All right, so we're so happy to have our next panel with us. Uh, Jackie, we're gonna start with you. Now from your vantage point at Step Forward, what were some of the biggest challenges facing people living in poverty during the pandemic? I would say um, employment, unemployment was the biggest, as well as education. You've heard it from the first panelists. So you had moms who didn't know what they were going to do with their children. We had people, um, many of the people that we serve have two jobs to make one paycheck. And those two jobs are gone. I think John Corlett talked about that. Um, so that's those were the biggest things that we saw people who uh, often didn't need our help, suddenly needed our help. And all of us, I'm sure all of the organizations that are represented here, were swamped and trying to figure out how to do this, you know, respond to this this pandemic quickly and also safeguard our staff at the same time. Wow, just just like a barrage coming at you. Absolutely. You know, we kind of felt like that in the news world too. <laughs> it's a barrage of stuff about the pandemic coming. So I'm gonna move on to Frank. And Frank, I just want to check in with you because we do have folks recording this on their own. So Frank, I want to make sure that you started your recording. So Frank, uh, yes. you guys, you did? Okay, beautiful. So Frank, you guys had to completely shut down your service. I'll talk about a barrage. For, you had to do that at the start of the pandemic and then you switched to online training sure. uh, with a population you know, that might not have easy access to the internet or might not even have digital devices. Yeah, that was very frustrating to us. While we were able to still continue to deliver services and assist employers with virtual events, we knew that there was people in the community who couldn't take advantage of our services. We did partner with Cuyahoga County and the Mandel Foundation to really to put um, a link people with an organization called PCs for People, where we could assist over a thousand individuals in the community who didn't have access to PCs or laptops, get them a laptop, and over 500 individuals broadband. But that's a, that's a band-aid. Yeah. The need continues, you know, we help so many, there's so many more. We're glad our doors are open. We wanna say we're open, we're here, and we're going to be out in the community to continue to deliver the services because there is a need. How to apply for jobs. So how were you able to get these devices into people's homes during the pandemic and well, train them? I mean, that had to be a challenge, right? Yeah, we had a, a lot of grassroots um, sending out things on Facebook, Twitter, uh, to the community, pastors, other organizations, we're mouth. If, if you need help, we're here to help you. And here's how we can link you. Here's where you could go to get your PC. So it was a lot of grassroots um, word of mouth to get people linked to where the resources were. And I'm going to ask Victor that same question. Victor, did you help uh, also with that, getting digital devices into people's home and helping to train them to use them? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we, we to, to a small degree, we helped getting uh, devices into the home, but we really supported the efforts of the Cleveland uh, School District. Um, they did a phenomenal job of getting devices and broadband into the hands of every student in the Cleveland School District. Uh, the bigger role that we played was actually teaching families how to use uh, not just the devices, but this new technology, you know, none of us knew about Zoom or Teams. 
And that was quite a transition for students and families to now go into Schoology and a lot of the tools that the school district were using. Uh, so we played a big role in educating parents on and families on how to use the uh, the technology. Oh, Schoology, I never heard of that one. It's <laughs> a new term. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, you know, the Zoom thing, we all have become Zoom experts now, right? So Victor, were there any challenges that were unique to the Hispanic population during the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of them in common uh, that have been laid out already. Our community was um, was overly represented in those frontline jobs that had to uh, report. So that was a challenge because with uh, with um, virtual schooling and students having to stay at home, our parents had a hard time balancing that. The other was the uh, the language barrier. You know. Um, there was just this need for all of these institutions and systems to now have bilingual support. You know, something we've been advocating for a long time and it was really uh, needed at this point. And I'll just give one example. You know, at one point there were no bilingual contact tracers in uh, the city of Cleveland. So that was something that really emerged um, and was known. Uh, we, we worked with um, the right people to get that fixed. But in the beginning and for some time, uh, that, that support was not there. So you were able to get them ramped up there. Did you see that response all around that people were able to ramp up and then provide bilingual services or no? Not really. And, you know, this, you know, there was a big community efforts to ensure that uh, places had the bilingual support and organizations like ours stepped in when we, where we could, but it's really just exposed another big need in, in Cleveland for bilingual supports in all of the systems that we have. So that's another gap that's still yeah. out there that needs to be addressed. Okay, I'm gonna bring Natoya into the conversation. And Natoya, um, also, I just wanna check in with you too to make sure that you're recording as well. I, I am recording. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you for being here. Now, Latoya, can we talk about education? We, no, we cannot talk about employment and education without talking about public transportation, right? So many frontline workers who were not able to stay home, they relied on RTA to get to those jobs, didn't they? Mm-hmm. That, that is absolutely true. Uh, public transit is one of the social determinants of health. It is one of the social determinants held equal to housing, education, workforce, and transportation and health. It is one of the challenges that unfortunately disproportionately impacts our community and the urban core. And so like many of my colleagues on this call today, RTA did not shut down. And when I think of frontline, first-line responders, I not only think about the men and women in the healthcare system, but I also think about the men and women who drove our buses and our trains who never stopped because they were committed to making sure that Clevelanders could get to work, could get to their healthcare appointments. And that, that's critical. And public transit for us from our lens is the vehicle to connect the community. It is an essential access point and connecting to work, to school, to healthcare, to entertainment, to arts. And it's a very necessary partner in our ecosystem. So we are glad, I am glad to represent this organization and to share the work that we've been doing. In the midst of all of that, we rolled out a comprehensive system redesign, uh, better known as NextGen. And what NextGen is, is really the next generation of our bus routes to make them more effective more efficient, greater access points. Uh, those were the drivers of our work, completely embedded in equity as we look at our rider demographics. And our rider demographics include 79% minority, 37% of those earn less than $15,000 a year. 60% of those are less than $35,000 per year. 77% of our riders are transit dependent and approximately 54% of our riders are completely transit dependent, meaning they don't have driver's license. Mm -hmm. So many of our riders are the same people 
that when Kristen was speaking, that were in those long lines that really grabbed your heart. We yeah. looked at that because those were yeah. your neighbors and mine, my family and yours that were out there in those lines. Because as John indicated, so many of those, so many of the people that were impacted were women. So many other people that were impacted were bilingual people and because they tend to have, unfortunately, the lower income jobs. And those were the first jobs to be cut. So when Frank talks about what he and his team are doing in their sphere of this work, it is really reaching out, trying to connect those people to the jobs. And so mm -hmm. those are the things that we're doing. Uh, I'm glad to be over here. I've been over here for about three months. And so I've brought a wealth of experience with me. I do have to give a shout out to... Uh, Dr. Chisholm, because she represents so much of Head Start. I'm a Head Start <laughs> baby. And so for me, when I think about social determinants of health, this is personal. Yeah. This is yeah, well, personal. Well, this you know, is shout, very personal. Well, Natoya, shout outs are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you, you provided a great segue for me because I wanted to go back to, to Jackie. And you also talk, brought up women, Natoya, which is great. Because Jackie, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how women were greatly affected by the pandemic in terms of employment loss. And uh, when childcare capacity was drastically limited, that forced some people to get out of the market completely. I mean, we've touched on this a bit, but can you expand on that? Sure. I, when you stop and think about when uh, we had the stay home mandate, and then when we opened up again, we could not have full capacity in our Head Start classes. So we went from uh, classes that were 22 students to nine students. Now we were able to, to kind of weather that storm, but the ones who took probably the biggest hit were the early childhood providers that are not Head Start. And so one of the things that we tried to do, not only with the parents, and we, um, I think, I can't remember, I think Frank talked about this, we provided tablets to our families because a lot of the, the parents that we had were trying to do uh, work with their children on their cell phones because that was the only Wi-Fi they had. So we provided uh, tablets that had all of the curriculum on it uh, for the parents. Uh, where we could with our partners, we have about 60 early childhood center partners. So we were making payments to them, even though they didn't have children in their sites and the federal government gave us permission to do that. So we were trying to figure out ways that we could support the families, the, the uh, programs that were already open and even how we could support the, uh, the families when we couldn't bring them into our classroom. So we created a virtual classroom. And again, and you've heard it from a number of people, all of a sudden, you know, this happened. And the question that we had before us is how do we continue doing education? You know, so we have a number of our uh, families, Cleveland schools, and that was wonderful, but we managed the six, um, six week old to five year olds. And so there was this major gap and then pregnant moms. So you couldn't forget about them. So we provided formula, we provided food. Uh, again, shout out to the food bank. Uh, we're partners with, um, I think everybody on the call, we're, we have some type of partnership uh, with them. And I think at the end of the day, all it came down to is what is the need? What is our part? How can we do it? And we recognize that we couldn't do everything for everybody. That I don't think any organization can, but we have these partnerships. So we'll do our part. And then who else has resources that we can give parents um, to? So I think that's the most important thing for me within this pandemic is all of us were doing this work. But yeah. there are some gaps that we've identified. And then, you know, how do we partner to make certain that a family was taken care of? Yeah, now speaking of gaps, I want to go back to Frank and talk about and then ask you, Frank, you know, we talked about all these people who, who lost their jobs, right? That their jobs went away. So did you see a new demand for job training and support over the last year? Are people, you know, trying to transition to different sectors, lost their jobs in retail and restaurants? Absolutely. Very much so. While we served far less people this past year, we doubled the number of individuals we trained. That was critical, especially focusing on where the jobs are, healthcare, manufacturing, and IT. There are many, many, many good jobs. The healthcare industry, the hospitals are saying we need not only nursing, but patient care. The individual who sterilizes the equipment, uh, medical assistance, same in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. So that was the word we were trying to get out. We can be a resource. We can, 
work with our community college or many other great proprietary schools in the community. And I want double AF this year, you know, all right, we did, you know, 500 in these sectors. Let's do a thousand this year. Let's, let's increase our impact. But that's the word we want to get out. We are a resource. We can help you. We can tell you where the jobs are, what are the growth industries and how your skills could link to those careers. Because uh, people have to go for the jobs that are here. Right, yes, right? yes. And people may not know about where the in-demand jobs are or what skills are required to get to those jobs. So we have career coaches here who can have that dialogue with an individual to try to understand what their interests are and skills are. And maybe even just say, hey, we can also give you additional skills by taking this class at Cuyahoga Community College and you can be within a few months in this field. Yeah, when I heard that there was like a big demand mm-hmm. for people who would sterilize equipment, I yes. was like, wow, I never thought of that. Exactly. You know, the Cleveland Clinic, I never knew the job existed up <laughs> until several months ago, to be honest. And now it's like we're trying to really promote that position. But there are many others <laughs> that, you know, really our employers in the community say we need this help. So it's our job to pretty much articulate understand that job so we can articulate it to individuals who need our service. Now, Victor, I wanted to ask you, you know, we, we hear people saying that we're in the middle of a labor shortage, right? We, have, we hear that from employers, right? And other people are calling it a wage shortage. Mm-hmm. Meaning this pandemic has really caused the conversation over what is a living wage and whether it's time to improve conditions for those earning minimum wage. What do you think about that, Victor? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's been a fight for 15 for a long time. And I think this is really forcing the uh, the conversation and the issue. And I think that it's about equity. And, um, and this is really, you know, com- you know, when, when you combine, you know, a lot of the racial uh, injustices that have happened for a long time, but really came to a head last year with COVID and all of these, it's really a conversation about equity and how we treat our people. And, um, and personally, I'm supportive of people saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, this is not paying me equitably, so this is not an option for me. And as um, systems and leaders of institutions, uh, we, we definitely need to help support that because mm-hmm. we want the best for our community. So I'm, so I'm very think, supportive. Do you, you think it's more of a wage shortage or is it more of a worker labor shortage? Or is it both? Uh, no, no, I, I think it's really a conversation around wages. Around wages. And um, so, you know, so the, I, I, I really believe it's that. Now, Natoya, I know you need to go in a few minutes. So I wanted to ask you one more question before you have to go. Can you talk about how the RTA helped keep writers safe during the pandemic? It, it was an extra cost, right, when the agency was dealing with this drastic drop in revenue. It was a major cause at a time when our organization, not unlike other organizations, experienced significant loss. We experienced 50% ridership, 50% ridership because of the stay at home orders. But at the same time, we wanted to be responsible in our community. You mean you had a drop? So saying you had a drop, 50% drop in ridership. 50% drop in ridership. Absolutely. But at the same time, we wanted to be responsive to our community. So the two key words that are the key words for 2020 are pivot and adapt. And so RTA, like other organizations, we pivoted to make sure that we made the appropriate investments in not only PPE for our operators and our staff, but to make sure that our vehicles are being cleaned every day, daily, cleaned, deep cleaning, so that they were sterilized and they were clean and they were safe. Safe for our riders, safe for our operators. And when I say, uh, so that was our pivot, our adaption was to make sure that we could just quickly pull together our resources and and put up those plastic screens, if you will. I'm not sure what the appropriate word is called, but to protect our riders and our operators while we kept driving. So we came to connect the community and despite the drop in ridership, the need was present. 
our folk were committed to making sure that Clevelanders and those that live inside of Cuyahoga County could get to the places they needed to go. So they were still going to work. They were still going to school. Some of them may have even caught public transit over to an area for various food bank areas, not at the lot off of East 9th Street, but at other locations that had food. And so we wanted to make sure that we were there as the community partner in this entire ecosystem. And for me, the biggest thing that came out of COVID is the level of unity and the intersectionality that we all see because the intersectionality came as a result of our community and communities in this country recognizing that we were really in the midst of two pandemics. We were in the midst of the pandemic for coronavirus and we were in the midst of the pandemic for racism. And that together really looking at the level of equity has really forced the conversation. How do we get to a space of equity and a, a key um, playing field? So when the foundation stepped up and, and it wasn't just the foundations and I don't know if Dale is still on the phone, but there are some personal high net worth people in this community that partner with them to really step in to make sure that we really are my brother's keeper. And for me, that is a feel good to come out of this community to recognize despite race, despite social economic status, we are one community and we are stepping up. Well, Natoya, we're so happy to hear about this community coming together and we, we appreciate everything that RTA did to get folks through the pandemic and those frontline people who stayed there and worked and helped those people get to their jobs or wherever they needed to go. Natoya, thank you for joining us. Thank you and thank you for the invitation. Early, but thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. So Jackie, I wanted to talk to you about the benefits cliff. Right. There's a, what does that term mean, benefits cliff? Let's talk about that first. Sure, because this is one of the biggest issues that we're now having to address. So for every dollar, when we talk about the living wage, so a person who earns a living wage suddenly is no longer eligible for other programs. So what you give, it's kind of like uh, you give it and then you take it away. And so that's a major concern. Now, we'll say that under because of COVID, some of the, the changes that, that took place was well, that the poverty index, it shifted. So it hadn't changed in decades. And so now their programs that initially required 150% of poverty moved up to 200%. Or people who had, were middle income at one point are now eligible for some of those programs. I don't so know shifted, if those- So it shifted to allow more people. More people. Advantage to, of right, exactly. I don't know if that's permanent. We're lobbying to make it permanent. Um, but that has been one of the biggest issues. So if it goes back to what it was, as we were talking about the $15, more people make more money, the less programs they're eligible to you know, receive. That includes SNAP, that includes um, food. Um, the food programs would also include some other like mental health issues. And we haven't really talked about that part of it, about what COVID did to mental health. Um, and so Look, that, Jackie, is, that can be a whole nother family. I know. <laughs> and, and I hope we I hope we have that conversation. But that is one of the things that I think we really need to talk about. It's not just money. When when Victor talked about that money is absolutely important. But if you don't connect it to everything else that a family has to address, then you're missing it. So now there's this huge gap. It's been a gap, but we just not really talked about enough to do to find a solution to it. Well, can you talk about how, like, you know, you're, you're getting food stamps, for example, sure. and all of a sudden you make too much money right. and then you can't have the food stamps anymore. So how does that contribute to the cycle of poverty? Oh, it, it's a major issue. I mean, so you've got people who have to make a decision. Do I take a job that earns more money, but I'm going to lose food stamps, for example. So maybe what I'll do is I won't take that job or I'll ask my employer to give me fewer hours because I can't make more money because I'm no longer eligible for something else. So these are the these are decisions that families are making on a daily basis. All COVID did was exacerbate it. That, but this is a problem and it's been a problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. So Frank, I wanted to ask you, do you hear people talk about this? Do you have clients who say that they have to stay at a certain income because they're concerned about this benefits cliff issue? 
Oh, no doubt about it. You know, I really support what Victor said earlier, 15 an hour, it should be. But there are individuals in the community, they may lose their daycare, you know, and that that's an impediment for people to say, oh, OK, I may be making a little more money, but in the long run, is, is it worth it if I'm going to be losing all of this? So, yes, I would think that a significant percentage of people coming into our doors, it's a concern. And you would hope that yet, as you're discussing with them, you you can map out a plan to get them that job to pay a wage where, you know, it will more than offset um, the impact of the benefits cliff. So, yes, it is a factor in the population we serve. Yeah, so we're, we're just about out of time panel, but I wanted to ask Victor. Victor, do you have any final thoughts on what needs to be done to address poverty in this region? You know that, that there is no magic bullet. You know, I think that there's uh, we, you know, we've heard the terms intersectionality, we've heard the terms, you know, systems, that this is just more than just one issue that we have to address. We have to look at it from a systemic perspective and, and tackle all of these things at once. So, you know, I think a lot of times we get stuck on what is the one thing and there is no one thing. That's a good final thought. There's no, no magic bullet. And I think somebody said earlier, this is a journey that mm -hmm. people are going to be on, right? So panel, this is a wrap for our conversation on fighting poverty and the pandemic. Thanks again to all of our panelists who joined us for this discussion and our audience for participating in the discussion. The virtual town hall was produced by Rachel Rood and she is a dynamo at Idea Streaming. So I just have to get give a big uh, shout out to Rachel Rood. I'd also like to thank our multimedia producer, Jean Marie Papoy, who is also a force, and digital project manager, Joe Sheppa. We couldn't get by without him either for helping us with this broadcast. We have a great team at IdeaStream. I am Marlene Harris-Taylor, IdeaStream's public media's uh, manager of health. And I'd like to thank all of you for engaging with us and stay healthy.